another enlightening virtual event sponsored by AARP Idaho. One of AARP Idaho's most successful programs is the New Knowledge Adventures program where events such as this one today are offered throughout the year. Your passion for lifelong learning is shared by the volunteer instructors and volunteer committees that enable us to offer these free classes. Um, you have been automatically muted. However, we encourage you to locate your chat button and tell us where you are joining from today. If anyone wants to put that in the chat and I'm already seeing Florida and North Carolina and I'm sure people are from all over the United States today. Today's event will be recorded and you can find um, the recording at arp.org backslash Idaho. We'll also put this in the chat a few times once Kim and Lisa start their presentation. Today we are fortunate to have Lisa Keithley and Kim Miller lead us a virtual tour of the Anne Frank Human Rights Memorial in Boise, Idaho. For more than 15 years, Lisa Keithley has led hundreds of tours through the Anne Frank Memorial for groups ranging from preschools to senior centers. She has the passion for sharing the memorial messages of the importance of being an upstander and the importance of human rights for all. She has also given presentations to schools and senior centers. <clears throat> in, addi <clears throat> <excuse me. clears throat> in addition to her work at the Wasma Center for Human Rights, Lisa has taken numerous classes and trips to learn more about Anne Frank, the Holocaust, and human rights around the world. She has a BA in business administration and a BA in elementary education. Our second presenter is Kim Miller. She joined the Wasma Center as a docent in 2019. She enjoys taking groups of all ages through the Anne Frank Memorial and seeing participants leave with a deeper understanding of human rights. Growing up in Northern Idaho, she saw firsthand a community stand up for human rights against hate. Kim has a BS in civil engineering and works as a structural engineer for a wood trust company. As many of you are aware, the holiday of Passover, which is the most observed holiday in the Jewish faith is celebrated this year from sundown on April 22nd, ending after nightfall on April 30th. Passover commemorates the Jewish, Jewish exodus from Egypt and celebrates freedom and redemption. While Anne Frank's diary does not specifically mention Passover, her story is a testament to resilience, survival, and the enduring Hoon spirit. Anne's courage and determination echo themes of liberation and hope associated with Passover. So we are excited to have you here virtually, all of you, and we hope you enjoy our event. So let's get started. I'm gonna turn it over to Lisa and Kim. Thanks, Kathy. Thank you, Kathy. I'll go ahead. Oh, I'm gonna go ahead and start our presentation here. Let's see, what's the plan? Here we go. Slide. Well, welcome. We are both very excited you are here with us. This mm -hmm. is a space that Kim and I are excited about. We share it regularly with people, and we're glad that you can join us. Although, when you come to Boise, please come and have a tour at the actual memorial. Mm -hmm. We wanted to share with you the overarching organization that is in charge of the memorial. Um, it is the Wasmuth Center for Human Rights. Our mission is to promote respect for human dignity and diversity through education and to foster individual responsibility to work for peace and justice. As an education center, our goal is to empower others to be upstanders in the classroom, community, and country. We have a variety of programs. We um, provide the docents, Kim and I, that give all the tours to the memorial through the memorial. We also have programs for travel. Um, cultural encounters is what we call them. We have trips coming up. There will be a trip to Cambodia, um, a fun program called Petals and Packs for a $50 donation. We buy in country a bicycle for a student in school and their family. It enables them to continue their educations. Mozambique, we will be going to South Africa and then on to Mozambique and Gorongosa Park. Um, it is just an amazing space. And we have, um, it, it, we are able to see all of the animals 
in as close to na natural setting as possible. We also have a program there, Each One Teach One, which with a sponsorship, you sponsor a girl to continue her education, um, five-year commitment, but otherwise those girls are taken out and married off as soon as elementary school is finished. Um, we will have a civil rights tour through the South next February and March. We'll have two different tours. So travel is a component that helps us all see the world maybe in a little different way. Business programs, we have a human rights certification. We have conversations, not confrontations. Both of those help employees maybe look at things through a little bit different lens. Um, educators, education is our main focus. We have a lot of training opportunities for teachers. We also have a full curriculum that we offer available. Um, we have a lot of programs for educators. Um, for students, we have a student youth leadership program, eight through 12th grades. We Tomorrow is our large arts and poetry competition. We'll have a big celebration tomorrow night. And we also have kindness camp for the four to eight year olds. Just letting you know that's covering up portions of the screen. Oh, thank you. So those are just a few of the programs that are offered through the Wasmus Center. Um, if you have any questions, you can see at the top of the screen, Matthew at the Wasmus He is, uh, he's well, he is the office, front office manager, and he will gladly answer any questions you have. All right, okay, let's get into the tour then. Um, Thank you for joining us today. If you, uh, in the 1990s, if you were said you were from Idaho, most people knew one of two things about the state. Number one, we grow a lot of potatoes. And, and a group promoting hate and um, intolerance called the Aryan Nations was located here. While we're very proud of our potatoes, uh, Idaho, good Idahoans have a long history of standing up against discrimination and bigotry like this. One example came in an opportunity in 1995 to bring a traveling exhibit called Anne Frank in the World to Boise. In the four weeks that it was here, over 50,000 visitors went through the exhibit. Uh, that was uh, quite a few more than the original organizers had ever anticipated. Uh, at that time, um, some community leaders thought we needed to have a more permanent uh, permanent human rights um, exhibit. And that's where the Anne Frank Human Rights Memorial kind of was born. Uh, in 2002, we broke ground and later that year in August of 20, or August of 2002, um, the memorial was dedicated. Since then, we have added an outdoor classroom, a rose garden, and uh, later this summer, we will um, dedicate a new educational building that will become the permanent uh, offices for the Watsmith Center. This is gonna take you through the map, so you kind of have an idea of the route we are going to be taking, even if it's virtual. Yes, so this is an overview of it. Again, this can be found at www.annefrankmemorial.org. You can also do a virtual tour on that site. So this part was the original part of the memorial. Um, we're going to start in the classroom Kim had mentioned that that was an addition, the Marilyn Schuler classroom. We will start there and we will walk around, talk about all the things that are available to see in the classroom. We will come down, talk about the um, garden. Been to the amphitheater about the statue of back um, over and talk about the French church writing table. 
the Rose Garden, the Rose Beale Rose Garden, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and our, our quote walls. Um, the new building will be in this section. It'll take up all of that. It'll border on Ninth Street and up to here. So, so that will be the new building. We'll just be able to talk about it because it's not open yet. Mm -hmm. So we will go ahead and start here with the Marilyn Schuler classroom. All right. In 2018, the outdoor classroom was opened and dedicated to Marilyn Schuler. Marilyn was a founding member of the Northwest Coalition Against Human Malicious Harassment and was a director for the Idaho Commission on Human Rights. Uh, former Governor Andrus called her a champion for human rights and basic de decency. Uh, inside the classroom, um, we have uh, placed um, some stone benches to sit and a video monitor that um, includes short video clips on human rights. Um, Lisa's pointing to it now. The memorial is <clears throat> part of the Boise Park system, so it's accessible 12 months out of the year. So this was the first time that we had any sort of protection from the weather. And we do tours 12 months out of the year. So we have done it in snowstorms, in rainstorms, and um, Actually, most importantly, in the summer, it gets really warm, and this is one area to get out of the sun. Can you go to the video? Uh, no. A little background for you. One of the education programs that we have developed is our spiral of injustice, and that came out of the idea that how did things devolve so far that elimination or death was on a large scale acceptable, I guess. Mm -hmm. So part of that is our spiral of injustice. And we have a short video mm -hmm. we wanna share with you. When injustice starts with, lang with language, it's when we put other people down by attacking them through the words we use against them. For example, when people may say something they think of as just a funny joke, but they aren't just jokes to the people they are targeting. They are hurtful to them as people. Avoidance is the exclusion of another person who has seen as not belonging. This can be conscious or non. It can occur anywhere, like a bus, or a lunch table. All it takes is for someone to turn their back on a single person or a group, and you've reached that second level of the spiral of injustice. This action limits the access of a person or group to events or social groups. Stopping someone from doing something equally or to the same extent as you just because they have different color skin or because they don't believe the same things that you do. Verbal violence happens just as often as physical violence. Any kind of threat or degrading rumor is an act of violence, and these kinds of actions are seen just as often as physical violence. Elimination is killing a person's body, spirit, or soul through oppression or murder. In our world today, we see people murdered for their beliefs or sexuality. Through bullying and isolation, many people's spirits are crushed, essentially making them feel like their life is not worth living. Language. Avoidance. Discrimination. Violence. Elimination. Spiral of injustice. So a lot of our education programs are set up around this spiral because it helps all different age groups understand how we get to horrible events in history uh, like the Holocaust and other genocides. Um, it always starts with language and it always, if it's unchecked, will end in elimination. 
but these three steps in the middle are fluid and may come in different orders. Um, and you might find that in certain historical events, some of these steps are um, actually even skipped. But what we like to emphasize at the memorial is, you know, language is an easy place to stop this spiral. And if, if people understand the impact that that has, um, then um, we can hopefully keep, uh, keep the spiral from going to completion. As a visual representation of the spiral, uh, local artist Ken McCall was commissioned to um, to make what what is called the other. The other is a metal sculpture that is genderless, sexless, um, ageless, lacks any discernible ethnicity or nationality, and the figure is bound by the spiral. If you look closely, the words of the spiral are etched into the binding of this of this individual. This is really kind of a fun and interesting stop on the tour because uh, school children and tour participants can walk around it. They can touch it. Um, the words on the spiral are in English, Spanish. Chinese, uh, Arabic, Hebrew, and Braille. And Braille is always really popular to like run your fingers over and um, uh, um, sorry. Visitors often express feelings of sympathy that they themselves have felt like the other at some point in their life where they felt excluded or just like they didn't belong. So this is kind of where a lot of our other educational programs jump off from. On the back side of the Marilyn Schuler classroom, Oops, we sorry. wanted to um, recognize that the Holocaust was not the only genocide, that genocides came before it, genocides came after it, genocides are ongoing. Um, we list the six United Nations recognized um, genocides. Uh, interestingly enough, when, when this went up, um, Armenian genocide was not yet recognized by the United States as a genocide. And so the director at that point got a letter from the Turkish embassy saying, uh, you got to take that off that's not a recognized um, genocide by the United States. And he could write back and say, but it is by the UN, so it's staying. So those are the six that are listed there. The Armenian was 1915 to 1917, about 1 1.5 million deaths. Ukrainian was 1932-33 between 2.4 and 12 million people were killed. That one was interesting in that it was starvation. So they went in and took all the food and that was what caused those deaths. The Holocaust, 33 to 45. Cambodia was 75 to 79, one and a half to three million people. And those were people with any type of education Again, that trip to Cambodia comes out of that even to this day because they are still rebuilding their education system that was destroyed in 79. Um, Rwanda, 1994, mm -hmm. the shortest genocide and the most brutal in that guns weren't used machetes were the was the most common weapon used bosnia from 1995 um on our spiral you'll notice that we don't say death at the end it's elimination because that idea that you can eliminate a culture in the united states we all have 
been hearing more about Native American schools and the fact that their culture was, they tried to eliminate their culture entirely. They had to cut their hair. They couldn't speak their language. They could not participate in any of the programs, um, any of the cultural dances or events that normally they would have. Um, so that's another example there of that elimination. Um, and a question we often ask is, what's lost with elimination or genocide? And it's a broad, broad answer. There are so many things that are lost besides the culture. You, you lose that passing on of information. You lose, how did they make those baskets, Native American baskets? How did they do all these different things? So that's just, again, that recognition that there is more than just the Holocaust and it, and it continues. From there. Next slide. Uh -huh. All right, uh, so this area of the memorial was designed with input from tribal representatives and it honors the original tribes of the Boise Valley, including the Coeur d'Alene, the Kootenai, the Nez Perce, the Shoshone Paiute and the Shoshone Bannock. Um, the area was dedicated to recognize that the land that the memorial sits on was inhabited and sacred to these tribes long before Idaho was even a state. So this is to recognize um, just that culture and that it um, predates, predates the memorial. Um, it also honors the cultural and the historic contributions of the indigenous people that first settled the Boise Valley. All of the stone is from the Nez Perce tribe up in central to north Idaho, too. Mm -hmm. Do you want to say anything else about this? Okay. The center was approached by Jerry Klinger. He had been reading his, he was doing a family history, he'd been reading his aunt's journal. And she had this section on, well, none of us would be alive basically, I am paraphrasing, none of us would be alive if it weren't for Reinhold Christman and him taking us into their, into his factory. And he stops and says, what? He's never heard of him before. So he's, he did some research and Reinhold Christman owned a factory and he did similar to what happened with, um, Schindler, he brought them into the factory and he, the kids were kept in there. Um, they had a daycare center. So it was Jerry's contention that he needed to be recognized. And so he um, had this stone and it just recognizes what Reinhold Christman did. He is not listed among the righteous among the nations because of the requirement um, specifically that you have to prove why, what was his motivation. And since mm -hmm. even his family had no idea he had done this, they couldn't fulfill that requirement. Jerry contacted his family. Part of them went to Venezuela and part of them went to Canada. And the group from Canada had no idea that he had done this. And they came down for this dedication and it was fun to visit with them. So an another recognition of someone who went outside, was, a, was an upstander. He chose to be an upstander and he saved a lot of lives. They think about 700. So the Butterfly Garden is located just on the outer portion of the memorial. In Boise, along the Boise River, we have a paved bike and uh, walking path called the Greenbelt. And the Greenbelt goes right by this section of the memorial. So it, even if uh, 
people are not visiting the memorial, they'll pass the Butterfly Garden. The Butterfly Garden was dedicated to the children that perished during the Holocaust. And um, to that end, it's filled with color and life to just kind of honor um, what they didn't eventually, I mean, they didn't get to live out their lives. Um, included in the Butterfly Garden, sit on the next mm -hmm. slide, is a poem called The Butterfly by Pavel Friedman. Uh, Pavel was a um, was sent to the, the Terezin camp um, and he was later sent to Auschwitz where he was killed. But he wrote this uh, poem, The Butterfly, that I will read for you. Um, it says the last, the very last, so richly, brightly, dazzlingly yellow, perhaps if the sun's tears would sing against a white stone, such, such a yellow is carried lightly way up high. It went away, I'm sure, because it wished to kiss the world goodbye. For seven weeks I've lived here and pinned up inside this ghetto, but I have found my people here. The dandelions called to me and the white chestnut candles in the court, only I never saw another butterfly. The butterfly was the last one. Butterflies don't live here in the ghetto. And that's one that we like to bring up with school groups that come through here because, you know, these were kids that were their age and he's talking about the beauty that he sees in nature, um, but that, that he no longer sees butterflies in the camp. Sadly, of the 15,000 kids that were in Terezin, only 152 survived. But again, we, we have the Butterfly Garden to just honor and remember all of them. Before we step into the section on Anne Frank and the memorial, I wanted to make sure everybody had a general, at least a general idea of what the building, the annex, that they lived in look like, that they hid in. So here is the opening. Here's the main street. There's water right over here that you can't see. You walk in the main doors to the offices to get to this back annex, because like a lot of European cities, you were taxed on the uh, frontage on the street. So they went back instead of sideways. So um, usually tall buildings and they would build the annex in the back. From the front, you cannot see this section of the building at all. So to get from the front door back to the annex, once you go in the front door, there was only one opening here. So this is the section that they hid in. Uh, mm -hmm. This floor was Otto and, and Edith, Mr. and Mrs. Frank, their two daughters, Margot and Anne. Upstairs was the Van Pels family. It was also their living room. They had a little stove. And up here was the attic. And that was used for storage. Anne spent a lot of time going up the stairs and sitting in this attic just for <laughs> privacy, basically, just to get away. Um, but we'll go ahead and go through the memorial. But I wanted you to have kind of a visual of what we'll be talking about. So it will be this back section. So with the memorial, we have the butterfly garden here. You can come around. This represents that bookcase that they put in front of the stairs to the annex so that it was not visible. You come around and you go up the stairs to the main plaza area. And these are the number of stairs Anne Frank climbed to get into the annex area. Mm -hmm. So here is, once you get to the top of the stairs, I didn't have any good pictures because I couldn't get high enough. Here is the statue of Anne Frank. Um, she looks to be peering out of a window. Down in the cement, they cut, put cut marks to show the size of that, that area. So it's not very big. And this was the floor where 
the section with Anne and Fritz, the dentist, when he moved in. And Marco and her mom and dad shared this space. And it's fun for the kids to come in and see, you know, we get them all in that this section, you know, and show them a picture with two beds and a dresser in this section. And they get a better feel for how restrictive it was for her because she was 13 when she went in. Um, the statue itself was, it was a national search and Greg Stone out of Massachusetts is the one who won the contract. Uh, he, in his obituary, it was listed as the thing he was most proud of. Um, it is a life-size statue. During the building of this, it started in 95 and didn't open until 2002. They had a program for school children in Idaho and they would bring their pennies, nickels, dimes, quarters to their teachers. And those teachers put that money, rolled that money and brought it in and they raised almost $60,000 to pay for this statue, which is pretty darn amazing. She is looking out the window across to this section. And here is the Rose Beale Garden, the Frank Church table. And behind it is the garden with a tree. And we'll talk more about the garden when we get there. Anything you want to add? No. Okay. Frank Church. Frank Church. Fascinating fellow. He and his wife were from Boise. And they donated this cement work area. Originally, I've been told that the idea was BSU is very close. So Boise State University. So students can come over there, sit in the memorial where it's calm and relaxing and work on, on their homework and things like that. Um, there's no electricity. So, <laughs> you know, laptops and that kind of thing didn't work. So it's it's never really been used for that. But Frank Church was, his whole life was dedicated to human rights. Mm -hmm. And it, again, a fascinating man. He was elected at age 32 to the Senate. Uh, he helped craft the civil rights legislation. He um, was one of the very first legislators to stand up and say the civil or the Vietnam War, not the Civil War, the Vietnam War was wrong, and that was very, very unpopular. Um, he he created the largest system of protected wilderness in the nation. In Idaho, we have the Frank Church Wilderness of No Return area to recognize all the work that he did there. And he also chaired the Church Intelligence Committee, um, which I personally did not realize the significance of until I read a book, which that link should be available to you guys, I believe. Um, yes, the reading list was sent uh, in email to everyone. Okay, thanks, Sheena. And there is a church, there is a book about Frank Church, and it's The Last Honest Man, and it was fascinating. He ran for president against Jimmy Carter, and he lost. Um, so they dedicated, again, he spent his life working on issues of human rights for everyone. All right, that brings us to the Rose Beale Legacy Garden. Rose Beale was a Holocaust survivor and an early docent um, uh, early on in the memorial's history. Um, sorry, I want you to be able to see this. Um, Rose um, predates me. Um, Lisa got to meet her and know her, but um, she shares her story of coming to the U.S. And I think it's just fascinating. We'll hear a little bit more from um, later in the presentation, but uh, 
when Rose was a teenager in Germany, her family was actually deported to Poland to one of the camps and only survived because the train was turned back at the Polish border. When they returned to Germany, they their visa came through to um, immigrate to the United States. And uh, what I found was really interesting, the visa agent or the clerk at the visa um, office advised Rose and her family to book passage on a ship that bore a U.S. flag. Um, war had not been declared yet, um, and maritime law stated that once war was declared, ships returned to their ports of origin. So had they been on a European flagged ship um, when war was declared as they were in transit, they would have the ship would have been turned around. Because they were on a U.S. flagged ship, they made it to New York and uh, in the early 2000s, Rose moved to Boise to be ne closer to family and became involved in the um, Wasma Center and the Anne Frank Human Rights Memorial. The Rose Garden here is dedicated to Rose. It, her namesake, of roses were her favorite flower. And there are 18 rose bushes in the garden to represent the Hebrew number for life. The tree that Lisa was talking about in the middle here is a chestnut tree. In Anne's diary, she talks a lot about looking out into the courtyard and seeing the chestnut tree that grew there. Um, this is, um, a if you are looking from where the statue is, you can see this tree. Uh, the tree in Amsterdam has since um, died in, from disease. But before it did, uh, cuttings of the tree were sent around the world. And Boise was lucky enough, the Anne Frank um, Memorial was lucky enough to receive one of those cuttings, which is currently being, um, being grown and will hopefully replace this tree when it is large enough to transplant. At that point, we will actually have Anne's tree in our garden here. Um, anything else you'd like to say about Rose at this time, or should we? No. We have some more about Rose later. Moving on, <laughs> the wars ended and the UN is established. One of the first things the UN did was establish the Commission on Human Rights. Chairing this committee was Eleanor Roosevelt for the US and uh, also on the committee, representatives from China, France, India, Lebanon, Union. And the Commission on Human Rights was tasked with drafting a document on the fundamental human rights um, to identify them because that's what go away during the war. And they were hoping to learn from that lesson and forward. <clears throat> so the company drafted this. Uh, Boise had a whole uh, UDHR on this, um, partly because the designer of this portion of the memorial wanted people to stop and kind of be disrupted in their normal reading pattern and take some more time looking at this. Um, if you get a chance to see it in person in Boise, it's, um, it's fascinating to see how similar their struggles were in 1948 to our struggles in current events. Um, this was <clears throat> written as an aspirational document and was never meant to be binding, um, but it was more for the member nations to take back to their home countries and um, you know, model their own system of civil and human rights after. Um, <clears throat> when it was adopted by the, the full UN in um, 1948, uh, there were no votes against it. In fact, six of the absten abstaining members said they would not vote on it because it did not go far enough. So um, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is uh, a real key part of 
our memorial and we spend a lot of time with tour groups uh, looking through and reading some of these some of these tablets. Do you want to add? 